All right, guys, we are back with Broderick Chavez from the Team Evil Genius. So our last podcast uh, with Rodden, we went through we went through training, uh, a little bit of supplementation, a little bit of nutrition. Today, we're going to have a bit of lighthearted fun. Um, we're going to have a chat about one of Broderick's true loves, which is coffee. Um, today, we're going to go through uh, the benefits of it, uh, find out a few interesting facts about the history of coffee, and then we're going to ask the million dollar question to Broderick of what his thoughts are on bulletproof coffee, which I know we'll get a fantastic answer for. Um, welcome, Broderick. Welcome back. We'll Sir, be how are you? Very well. How are you doing? It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I have, I have plenty of this stuff. I have good conversation. I will be just fine. Perfect. You excited about coming to Perth, March 20th? I am as excited as my flawed personality allows me to be. Um, from what I understand, you guys have good coffee and people that want to know about the stuff I know about. It's all I can ask for in this world. So, And that'll be another thing. We also want messages. Uh, your thoughts on the best coffee in Perth. If you are located in Perth, uh, Broderick is a caffeine fiend. So... We want to take him to the best coffee shops in Perth. So if you can uh, shout us a message and let us know. And, and by the way, not 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 being a jerk, but you got some you you got something to live up to because I've been to Sydney and the coffee in Sydney was as good as anywhere in the world I've ever been. So Melbourne's better than Sydney. We shall see. All we right, see. We'll, we'll see what we can do in Perth for you. We'll see if we can uh, see if we Excellent. can match Sydney and Melbourne. Um, yeah. So moving on, basically. Caffeine. Obviously, you have a love of caffeine. Uh, you have a love of coffee. Um, yeah. Do you want to go through some of its uh, some of the benefits to it? Uh, what you know, so a little bit of the history, let's some start, of the benefits to it. I, I was going to say, let's let's as the pun goes, let's start at the beginning. Um, coffee is an evergreen bush of the genus Caffea. Um, by the way, for those of you that don't know, I'm a biologist, so I often speak as if I'm reading a textbook because that's the way my fucking brain works, so I apologize, but it is an evergreen bush of, this, of the genus Caffea. Um, originally, it was assumed uh, that the origin of the, the species was uh, Arabia, i.e. Arabica coffee. Turns out now in the modern age of genetic testing, it looks like the uh, actual prodigy uh, progenation of coffee was Ethiopia. But nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, there are two distinct uh, branches of the genetic family tree. There is uh, Cafe Arabica, and there is Cafe Robusta. Robusta is not particularly uh, well used in commercial uh, coffee sales, but it does have some really awesome uses. I will cover them in a second. Most of what you buy and think of as coffee is the Arabica variety. Uh, of that, there are then only in all the world, in all the fucking kinds of coffee, cups of coffee you've had, there's really only three, two, depending on who you ask, three genetic variants within that. Um, there is a heirloom of varieties. That's a word that may not make it to Australia, but in the U.S. and Europe, that refers to kind of the original or the... Um, you know, non-selected uh, varieties, basically wild. So there's heirloom varieties. Um, there is Bourbon and Tipica. Tipica is literally Latin for typical. It was the original coffee smuggled out of the Middle East by Dutch in the 1500s. Again, that depends on exactly whose history book you use. But interestingly, with those three varieties of coffee, makes all the different coffee beverages, all the coffee kinds and names and brands you've ever thought of. So the difference isn't entirely, possibly even mostly, the kind of coffee. It's other stuff, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, some other little just coffee knowledge. Uh, from the time you plant a coffee seed until you get the first crop of coffee, is a minimum of three years. Most respectable farms and farmers, it's five years. So one of the reasons coffee is so expensive is it's literally a five-year investment from seed and ground to coffee. And then on top of that, the first few years of crop are less than the later ones. So to really get good coffee crops, you're talking about a seven to 10-year-old uh, plantation. So that's one of the many reasons why coffee is expensive. 
secondarily, <clears throat> and this is, um, you know, in relation to that, there's only three kinds of coffee. The biggest factor in coffee before the roast and the brewing is geography, where it's grown. There's a concept in French wine, French food in general, called terroir. It's French for of the earth, of the ground. And the concept is where you plant the thing, it takes on the nature and behavior and characteristics of the place. The soil, the rainfall, ex the, even, even the uh, you know, insects and all of the things in that environment have a direct impact on what happens. That is the case with coffee. So there's a strong influence of terroir. You could take the same Bourbon bean planted in the island of Java, you'll get a cup of coffee. Take that exact same bean and plant it in Hawaii, get an entirely different cup of coffee because the altitudes are different, the humidities are different, the uh, soil, you know, Hawaii is highly volcanic, Java not so much, th those sorts of things. So there's a lot, a lot of differences in regards to geography. But with this conversation and the ultimate direction of this conversation, hopefully ending with some health and performance benefits, the biggest issues on the plate there are not the variety of coffee and not even the geography of coffee, although those matter, but more to the botanical and uh, medicinal quality of the cup you end up with is really about the farming methods, the processing methods, and then the roasting methods. I'll explain. Coffee grows ultimately in something that looks very much like a cherry. So they're actually referred to as cherries. They're not botanically, but they're referred to as cherries. It's a fruit, usually of the red variety, not always. And in it are two, what we call coffee beans. They're actually pits. They're not beans, an entirely different thing, but they look like beans, so that's how it came to be. But when you look at a coffee bean, you're looking at half. They sit like this inside of that fruit. The reason I bring up that fruit is there are different ways to process the product. You can harvest the coffee, pick the beans, and immediately strip the fruit off, dry the bean. Okay, that removes the bean and the fruit. Okay, so the bean dries in open air, and you literally just have the action of dehydration, nothing else. There is another process called a wet process or a fermented process where the beans are harvested with the fruit on and they're just left to basically, kind of sounds like a harsh word, but basically rot. And the fermentation of that fruit, think of all the things that ferment, wine, cheese, alcohol. There's lots and lots of complex chemical reactions taking place around, on, and you know, in the vicinity of these beans. They then take on some of those chemical compounds, chemical characteristics. They are literally altered, much like sugar, fruit sugars are altered to become alcohols in the case of wine or beer or something. Literally, compounds within the bean are converted via biological actions into other compounds. That is one of the major producers and or liberators of some of the excellent botanical qualities of coffee. Uh, most of your antioxidants and very, very high tier flavor compounds come via that process. Okay. So now we've got bean harvested, treated in some way, either dried or fermented. Now it's you know stripped, cleaned, and prepared. Now you have beans, which by the way are a very funny green color. If you've never seen an, uh, an unroasted coffee bean, they're a really strange kind of khaki green unappealing color. And from there, they turn into this you know, beautiful brown you know, coffee color. The reason I make such a big deal about that is because basically roasting coffee is, is cooking it. You're roasting it, much like you would a piece of meat. Think about the radical difference between a raw piece of meat, and a roasted piece of meat. They, they, ba they barely have any similarities at all. Texture changes, the quality changes, digestibility changes, deliciousness changes, everything about it changes. That's what we've got with coffee. You're now going to apply heat. That heat causes caramelization, pyrolysis, the Maillard reaction, all of these complicated you know, chemistry functions that are converting very large compounds into smaller compounds 
and simultaneously fusing some of the smaller compounds and building them up into larger compounds. So you actually get a transition of this flavor profile. Um, one of the interesting things people don't realize is light roasted coffee actually has more caffeine than dark roasted coffee. Dark roasted coffee has more flavor compounds, but caffeine is heat degradable. So the more you roast it, the more you break down the caffeine. And then that, that comes into play again later when you brew coffee. The amount of time you apply heat to it ultimately affects, the, again, what comes yeah. out, literally. So here's the thing. You, you can go through this chain of events from, okay, you pick your genetic variety of coffee. You pick your geography. And most of that would be predominantly about your, your, what appeals to you. Uh, and I won't go into it now, but if you want to study the subject, there are rough regions of coffee, you know, Pan Pacific, you know, South and Central America, you know, Australia, China, you know, Aust Australo, I forget how they word it in a coffee business, in Indo, -Aust in Indo Austrian, Indo Australian is the Chinese right. and Australian, which by the way, some of the best coffee I've ever had was at a coffee plantation in the Gold Coast of Australia fucking amazing great coffee literally though part of the full lore was was literally like right off the bush like but, yeah. but anyway um that if you don't know there is coffee in china india and eastern australia uh, and the australian's good uh, but anyway each one of those regions the coffees tend to have similar characteristics both because the people that originally migrated there planted the coffee brought the same coffee with them Partly because they share similar, you know, weather and ge geographic uh, components, roughly same soil types, roughly same weather patterns, etc. So the coffees begin to take on very similar things. You know, the coffee from Papua New Guinea is very, very similar to the coffees from you know Indonesia and, and etc. Because they're close together, they share the same weather, that sort of thing. So you choose your variety, you choose your geography, mostly based on what you prefer. From there, you now have to differentiate between what you prefer and what you actually want in the cup. For instance, if you're looking for a coffee that is um, particularly high in caffeine, you're actually going to want to look at South and Central American coffees. One, because of the original variety of bean that was there, slightly higher in caffeine. Two, because of this early on about the robust, and I said we'll come back to that. Um, one of the, the reason why Robusta is called that is because it's a very robust plant. It grows a lot of coffee and it grows in a lot of conditions that other coffees will not. The problem is it makes a pretty crappy cup of coffee. However, and this is why my you know, biologist roots come through on this, there is something you could do called grafting. If you take a plant and you cut it at a certain angle and join two pieces of plant together, kind of like you were mending a pipe, and treat it in a certain way, you can actually get two different plants to grow together and form one plant. What a lot of South and Central American growers will do is actually grow a crop of Arabica and grow a crop of Robusta and put the Arabica plants, graft them onto the Robusta roots. So you get the root bed, which is very robust and capable of growing a lot, and feeding a lot of coffee, but you get these beautiful, delicate Arabica beans and then the good coffee. The catch is that process seems to uh, upregulate the volume of caffeine produced in the plant. So South and Central American coffees typically have a little more caffeine than the rest of the world. Okay. It's, it's a quirk and it's cool. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, where my you know, pedigree is. It, uh, trust me, if I had my life to do over again, I'd be in you know, Brazil right now grafting coffee plants together. There's not much, not much choice that would be the truth. So if people need the proper pick me up in the morning, they're going to be going uh, South American coffee. Yeah, Interesting. Very, likely, okay. very likely. And coincidentally, it's probably not a coincidence that if you went to the grocery store and bought a breakfast blend, almost always what you're getting there is Brazilian, Colombian possibly Costa Rican coffee. So the it's breakfast brands are stronger. Exactly. Well, that is stronger is a bad word. They have more caffeine. Yeah. Okay. Strong is a subjective word. Strong in what? Strong in caffeine? Absolutely. Strong in flavor. Now that's probably an East African coffee. East African coffees 
the original um, heirloom varieties have lots of uh, flavor compounds that have been lost in some of the other coffees. Um, last paper I read, uh, your, your, your heirloom varieties have somewhere north of 800 various flavor components within, within the bean, various chemicals that present various flavors that are actually detectable by the human palate. There's even more, more in there than that, but the human palate can discern as many as 800 of those individual flavors, <laughs> whereas most of the rest of the world, it's less than that. Um, okay. Also, one of the reasons it's assumed that Ethiopia is the um, genesis of coffee is it's also where you find the highest genetic diversity. There are more uh, micro deviants of coffee in Ethiopia than anywhere else in the world. That usually reflects back to it had a head start genetically. Oh, okay. So, so, um, so we've got bean, we've got process. Now and now we're at roast. Yeah. Once you begin to apply heat to coffee, you are cooking it and therefore changing it. The more you roast it, the more you reduce caffeine, the more you increase individual sugars. You're liberating sugars from larger compounds, large carbohydrates, large proteins are breaking down into sugar, something called the Maillard process in, uh, in, in culinary arts. As you do that, you are changing the botanical profile. You're moving from uh, acids toward bases. Acids tend to break down under heat. Base compounds, uh, alkaloid compounds, tend to build up under, uh, under heat. So you get this shifting in what's going on. And also you get a liberation of compounds that are locked very deep in the bean. And that's where you get the release of all the really exciting health benefit-wise the exciting um, antioxidants, things like eugenol, all of the many polyphenols, are, they've identified like now 50 of them, but polyphenols, you know, many phenol bearing uh, molecules that are very, very strong antioxidants, have strong upregulation of the C cells within the liver. They're, you know, everybody wants to you know, drink or take you know, milk thistle pills or some nutty ass thing to help their liver health, quite literally. <laughs> Black coffee is probably the only thing that actually has any benefit on the long-term metabolic health of your liver outside of, you know, not doing a bunch of drugs, damaging your liver. So. Okay. So it's coffee ends up being very beneficial for the liver. Absolutely. Coffee is very good for the liver. Um, also it, some of those polyphenols and some of the, uh, I don't want to say undefined, but somewhat undefined, unclassified compounds seem to have very strong impacts on vitamin K production, therefore coagulation, and let's call it blood health. Um, it's been found that um, alcoholics notoriously have very poor vitamin K production you know, because of the act, act of drinking alcohol. And it's been shown without even reducing their alcohol intake, the addition of coffee improves the quality of their blood and the quality of their coagulation. Huh. Okay, because we, I mean, always the general, the general uh, understanding of coffee has always been that um, too much coffee can be bad for you. Well, um, that's first of all, that's a just a silly statement because too much of anything, you know, too much of anything is bad. Toxins for you. are defined much, by the dose. Yeah, too much porn is bad for you. Too much anything, it's anything. That's a fucking. That's just when somebody says something like that. That's just their face making noise. That there's there's not even a thought. <laughs> You know, that is, you know, fucking water's awesome for you. Stay hydrated. Water's good. You know, fucking hold your head in a bucket for 15 minutes. <laughs> Tell me how good that is. You fucking nitwit. So I just try not to say anything that's stupid to me and I won't yell at you. But <laughs> the reality, as I've come to uh, assess it, the 1980s was the beginning of non-biased coffee research. They started to actually research coffee in a, in a light where, oh, maybe this has some benefits rather than just immediately trying to prove the negatives, which you can do very easily in science. You can decide something's bad, set up studies to make it look that way. Um, you know, they did that with steroids from, you know, 1950s through 90s. Um, the truth is they were just really crappy, poorly designed studies that were intended to prove it negative. Once coffee studies were begun to done begun to be done in a more objective fashion, the reality is every year 
studies were done with more coffee and finding more benefits. One cup was had these couple of little benefits, a little bit. Then they, you know, two cups a day. Now they're up to six cups a day. People that consume six, as many as six cups of coffee per day have lower incidence of stroke, lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease, um, less of all strange things, less hip fractures in, in geriatric patients. There's so many benefits they're finding now associated with coffee. And the interesting thing is it's not one thing. They're not finding, oh, it's the caffeine or, oh, it's the polyphenols. It's apparently coffee as a unit, as a thing. Um, two interesting things about coffee that just jumped to my head and are a little out of place, but one, um, like the, 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 you know, the, the, you know, organic and, you know, pow power food idiots and those people will immediately, oh, blueberries, blueberries are so full of antioxidants. Blueberries are so good for you. One 12 ounce cup of coffee has more antioxidants than three servings of blueberries. And yeah. Coffee doesn't go out of season, and it's always fucking delicious. <laughs> Second, um, these studies have been done uh, going back, actually going back all the way to the 1960s. If you took 200 milligrams of caffeine tablets, you know, caffeine from tablet form, and you got 200 milligrams of caffeine from coffee, the effect profile of the caffeine is almost identical you'll get the same elevation in catecholamine response, same elevation in alertness. All of the caffeine acts are the same. But the side effect profile is literally half to 40% from coffee as it is from anhydrous caffeine tablets. And no one has the slightest idea why that is. Even still now? Correct. Even okay. now, there's, it's clearly some synergy of you know all the you know, carbohydrates and oils and things within coffee, but no one's been able to identify it. But again, I don't want to sound like a you know like one of those organic kooks that I make fun of, but I, I don't find it a surprise that nature did, you know is able to do this shit better than humans. Nature's yeah. had quite a head start. It, you know, been been on about growing coffee a lot longer than we have. So yeah, surprise me. Okay, that's interesting, right. fact, especially about the blueberries. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Um, real quick, so we get through all this, we've got coffee, and we've even determined a roast. And very roughly, lighter roast, higher caffeine, darker roast, lower caffeine, regardless even of where it was grown and all that. As you roast coffee, you tend to reduce the stimulant factors and elevate some of the uh, polyphenol-type uh, antioxidants. So Again, what you're intending to do with the coffee probably has a strong impact on what you, you know, do to the coffee. A breakfast roast typically will be a light roast from South and Central America. You're going to get a very strong delivery of caffeine, not much else. Then if you went with, a, say, an East African coffee that was roasted more, you're going to get less caffeine, but more of the antioxidants, polyphenols, etc. So... You could, if you want to be really generic, you could say, you know, South Central American coffees for performance, African Pacific coffees for health, although none of them are unhealthy, but you could, you could kind of lean it that way. It would just be more beneficial. Correct. A little yeah. more of those beneficial things. And then after all of that, you got your coffee, your variety, your process, your farming methods, your roast. Now that's how do you prepare the cup of coffee? And that ultimately has influence on what's in your cup. Uh, I won't beat this to death because it's, it's literally an art form that I won't even be able to do justice to. But very roughly, when it comes to coffee brewing, you have just a couple of factors. You have the coffee you've chose. Obviously, we've covered that. You have the grind size, how rough or fine the coffee is ground. Okay, And that again, base, very basic geometry, the finer you grind the coffee, the more surface area you now have. That means more of the coffee is going to be presented to whatever volume of water is pushed through it. If you, you know, think of you know, coffee grounds, if you crush that all into just like one ball of coffee and poured water on it, water would really not be touching much of the coffee, just the surface and not the inside. Whereas if you pulverize that into a powder, almost every molecule of coffee is going to get exposed to water. That will exchange, 
will change what's called the extraction volume. The amount of solids that are then pulled out of those beans into the cup. And then the last factor is a little less of a factor, but it is a factor and that is uh, temperature. So you have coffee grind size, um, time of the exposure between coffee and water and temperature. Um, and, and that's roughly it. It's just a manipulation of those things. More temperature, again, lowers caffeine, espresso type coffees. One, typically come from a darker roasted coffee. And then two, are exposed to high pressure and high heat. You get actually less caffeine per unit weight of coffee. The people misunderstand that. Yes, a little 15 milliliter you know, shot of espresso has a lot of caffeine. But if you actually go back and look at how much coffee, pulverized coffee powder, was responsible in making that, it's actually less caffeine than if you made that same amount of coffee into a drip or some other method. Okay. And then you also have methods like, uh, like a French press where you're literally immersing the coffee in water. Now, not only do you have that issue of surface area, but now you've got time because the water and the coffee are amalgamating, so solids are distilling out of that. And the reason I bring that up is if you're really looking for that botanical benefit, that medicinal benefit of coffee, you probably want to go with a method like a French press because you're one, getting a, a high level of immersion, a lot of time for the bean and the water to make friends. And two, you're getting uh, less filtering because it's just that kind of wire mesh situation instead yeah. of you know, all the complicated papers and cloths and all that. So you're getting a higher particulate matter. So you're getting a higher particulate that has been exposed to the water longer. So that's where you're really going to start imbibing. I don't want to sound like a kook, but the actual essence of the coffee. Okay. So the French pressing that you're going through there, um, that's what you'd see at a lot of the, uh, there you go. Yeah. So that's what you'd see at a lot of um, cafes. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, better gotcha. ones anyway. Better, better ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good sign for Perth right there because I think the majority of the cafes, that's, uh, that's what they have there. So we're off to a good start for you. Excellent. Um, I can ramble on about coffee for another hour, but I mean, that's your fundamentals. That's your yeah. fundamental. Okay. And in terms of uh, performance now, yes. timing of coffee, is there anything people should know in terms of, you know, how long it take before, just during the day. It, it always comes down to why everything. And when I'm, you know, when I'm in Perth and giving my, you know, big seminar, everything's going to come down to why yet yeah, people always ask, is this a good idea? Or is that a good idea? Why? What are you trying to do? It might be a great idea for what you're trying to do, but if you're not, it might be the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah. So it comes down to why if you are consuming coffee for the, performance effect, it has to be reasonably local to the event. Yep. So um, one of the magic powers of coffee is that it is pretty obviously, but from a biology point of view, you need to state it's a liquid and it's also a hot liquid. Okay. Liquids disperse into the human physiology much faster than solids. If you had to chew coffee, it would take longer for your body to dissolve it, disperse it. And this is already in liquid. Liquid moves into the body much faster. Hot liquids move into the body even faster. Uh, something you may not know is that when you drink you know, ice water or something, that water doesn't actually leave your stomach until it has been brought up to body temperature. So there's actually a reservoir of cold in your stomach. Uh, think about it. You're, you're homeo as a creature, you're homeothermic. If your body just allowed cold water to disperse into your body, it would wreck your body temperature, and you would have to spend vast amounts of energy to reheat yourself. Okay. That's why yeah, that reptiles sense. have to lay on rocks. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. it's actually basic. Okay, so the fact that coffee is liquid and hot means that it's a very rapid dispersion. So you get delivery of caffeine to the bloodstream very fast. So the timing is pretty goddamn proximal. Literally, you could be drinking your coffee as you're rolling into the gym and you're in the butter zone of effect. Okay. All of the medical science pretty much identifies the butter zone of uh, effective uh, therapeutic index between three and five, let's call it four milligrams per kilogram. So get on a scale, 
multiply that by four. That's how many milligrams of caffeine you're looking for pre-workout. Okay, cool. Well, that's a, that's a great formula to use. I'll, I'll make sure we put that one up. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. Now, uh, a second point I'm going to go over on time just a little bit here is if you are drinking coffee largely for the health benefits and not the performance benefits, you actually want to do something very counterintuitive. And that is you want to build up a resistance to the caffeine so that you can drink more coffee, getting more of the other stuff. So what you're saying is you're the healthiest person on earth. I am. I am. I, and, a, you know, according to the studies, if you drink six or more cups of coffee, you get less strokes, less heart attacks, less Alzheimer's. I am going to be lucid and live for fucking ever because I drink <laughs> way more than six cups of coffee a day, every day. Now, you went over my the butter. My wife smuggled coffee. And I, I had an intestinal blockage and almost died. And my wife smuggled coffee into the hospital and i drank coffee i had a tube down my fucking neck and i drank coffee next to the tube so, just so you know are you still alive and kicking now now you yeah. mentioned the butter zone so i'm yes. gonna have to ask you this the butter zone bulletproof coffee keto coffee adding organic butters to coffee uh you want to tell me where the thought of that comes from and what you think about that well, I, I, I could speculate where it came from. Okay. In uh, northern China, Tibet, um, even, even northern India, Pakistan, the concept of putting butter, specifically yak butter, in tea is very common. Now, they do this for a number of reasons there. One, because apparently their taste is in their ass, and partly because calories are at a premium. So it's a great way to get calories, you know, food tends to spoil. There's a lot of problems. So they're able to make butter. You, butter's not a particularly exciting food stuff. They've come to this kind of amalgam of, you know, hot tea and butter. So it's a great method of sustaining life and following their culture. So I, you know, I'm not busted their balls, but that's been a time honored thing. That's been there for literally thousands of years. So the concept of putting butter in hot beverages is not new. I suspect that this new idea of, you know, bulletproof coffee is just the stupid fucking keto people being stupid fucking keto people. They just keep trying to dream up new ways to make the same dumb ass wrong idea somehow marketable to a bunch of new stupid people that are willing to spend money on it. Um, I feel the same way about coffee. Even if bulletproof coffee turned out to be efficacious, which it, it even won't, and it's dumb. But even if it did, I feel the same way about coffee I feel about cocaine. Bear with me. <laughs> cocaine is awesome. It works amazing. There is absolutely no reason to fuck with it and make crack. Why would you do that? Like, why? who, who did cocaine and went, well, that, that, that's just never going to do. I need to step this up. No, it's fucking dumb. Same thing about coffee. Don't put anything in my fucking coffee. This is awesome. This is the personification of God. If he came to the earth as a beverage, he would be coffee. We don't need to fuck with it. Stop that. You want to put fucking oil and some rub oil on your naked body, fucking drink oil from a nipple, you have at it. But leave my fucking coffee alone because we will fight. <laughs> so so the uh, predisposed of it uh, as being... MCT oils, butter, anything like that is to burning body fat by drinking it from a well, biological point of, all, of view. The only thing that burns calories is activity. There's, no, you, there's absolutely no arrangement of eating that burns calories. They're just, they're just not, this is calories in, this is calories out. It's fucking impossible to drink something with calories and assume that it's going to give you a negative calorie effect. That doesn't work. Yeah. It, it, it violates thermodynamics, relativity, all that shit. It's just fucking ludicrous. Now, if you like followed the crazy, goofy fucking keto dictum and you really had no glucose and your body was converted to running on ketones and all it is, is the equivalent of putting sugar in your coffee. It's just calories in your fucking coffee. So, I mean, why fuck with the coffee? Just eat butter fucking or 
or, or, hey, oh, I have an idea, or scrap all of that and just eat the fucking carbohydrates. Huh? Mm -hmm. How about that? So it's with a, with a general group of people that are sort of, you know, obviously the people that buy it, um, you will look at people just being overweight, uh, almost, you don't want to say looking for a lose weight fast, but that's kind of what it is. Stop it. Um, you know, and assuming that they're not, you know, underfed people from Ethiopia or for, from Tibet or anything like that, yeah. they're, it's just literally adding more calories. Absolutely. There's day. no version of eating that's low calorie. It's, 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 it's food by definition is fucking calories. Mm. If it didn't have any calories in it, it wouldn't be food. It has no value. Like you, it, it, that's the whole concept. If you're putting it in your face, you're adding calories. So, you know, I, I don't mean to be mean, but you all, anyone out there who needs to lose weight, you need to lose food. That's where you need to fucking make that equation. Mm. Lose weight, lose food, gain weight, gain food. That's why we, you know, strength athletes eat so goddamn much food because we want to get bigger. And when we want to get smaller, strangely, what do we do? Uh, we eat less food. Calorie deficits, deficits and calorie surpluses. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, don't, fuck with don't, don't fuck with Broderick's coffee. Exactly. God damn it. <laughs> uh, any, other, any other key points or anything that you want to jump on that might be of – importance to listeners or any fun facts that you would have um in terms of caffeine we got over that pretty thoroughly today yeah i'm sure i'm you know i'm sure that i do have 27 more things stuffed in my head but <laughs> I mean, you know people don't want to be you know lectured on it all i would say is the preponderance of research suggests that coffee is great for you great for performance great for overall health very roughly speaking the more you consume, the better off you are. Uh, oh, actually, I will give you an interesting topic, a little, little interesting bonus kernel. Uh, in human, human genetics, there's actually two variants of the P450 cytochrome uh, gene that metabolizes caffeine. And it turns out, and this is wacky, who'd have thunk it, people with equatorial lineage, people that come from equatorial regions. Ooh, I don't know, Kenya, Ethiopia, these places where coffee actually comes from, okay? People of equatorial genetics tend to metabolize caffeine as much as two times faster than people of northern and southern uh, non-equatorial genetics. So if you are, you know, Siberian, you may have less tolerance to caffeine. And if you are, you know, Greek or Kenyan or something of that nature, you probably have a very, very high tolerance to caffeine. Probably not a surprise that the people that you know, came into existence with that botanical product have the highest uh, tolerance to it. So I find that clever and interesting. Okay. okay. So in terms of, uh, in terms of performance, um, we just want to go through a quick overview of it that you can literally because if it's hot coffee that you've got uh, a very, very short window for performance, you can have it, as you said, literally rolling into the gym, you'll see performance benefits um, right. to higher caffeine. So breakfast blends, um, things of, is it South American you'd said? Correct. Uh, have higher caffeine, so probably better for performance where um, some of the other blends will be better for, in terms of antioxidants. Um, Correct. Okay. so. Have a mix of both, basically, if you're looking at performance Absolutely. and health. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. Cool. Um, and if, you know, if you kind of want to follow, like, you know, like wine people and cheese people have these kind of rules, which I'm not big on rules, but if you were to, you know, go to a coffee house in Europe or something, this is what you would find. In the morning, they would serve, a, obviously, a breakfast blend. There's a South Central American type coffee. And then come lunch, they would transition over to maybe in East Africa. And then at dinner, they would actually migrate all the way over east on the globe to a Sumatran, Indonesian, um, um, Southern Indian type coffee. And basically the concept is the later in the day, you get a little less caffeine and a little more antioxidants as the day rolls That's along. Perfect sense. Late dinner coffee would definitely be something, you know, East African or East. And a breakfast coffee would be, you know, the hemisphere I'm in. Okay. Okay. It's interesting. Um, I think you've covered coffee probably more thoroughly than I have ever heard before. 
Um, so that was just a, an intro guys on, uh, sort of performance enhancements, I guess, uh, histories. Now you're going to get tenfold more on a lot of other performance enhancements. Um, also with nutrition as well, um, supplementation. So we're going to go through a ton of stuff that's going to be really, really interesting on March 20th. So absolutely, absolutely. Well, Keep in mind, you. folks, th this, is, this is just my own personal habit. The, 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 value, the volume of knowledge I have on coffee is just because I love the shit. Yeah. Um, this, this is actually my job. So I'm, I actually get paid to know this stuff. Yeah, so, so uh, we're going to bring in a ton, a ton of knowledge. Once again, um, what we're going over in the seminar is being created. Um, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. We're going to go into depth with... Uh, any, everything from trainings to nutritions to supplementation to performance enhancements to uh, organization. How to, organization, how to plan programs, how to plan absolutely Careers. everything. What's that? How to plan literally your entire career, how to have a very long term top down planning, you know, from now till, you know, five years from now. So it's going to be a lot of information. Um, We'll have a couple more podcasts that will come through just on a few other random topics before we get to the day. Uh, we want to thank Broderick for coming on this evening. Um, and we will speak to you guys in the next week or so. And we're going to have some more fun, interesting topics to uh, cover. So thank you again, uh, Broderick from Team Evil Genius, for coming on and chatting with us, explaining us caffeine. <laughs> <laughs>